Dr. Chuang Chang, President of the Chunghua Institute for Economic Research, uh, Dr. Yi Chung La, President Prospect Foundation, uh, all my colleagues who've gathered here, experts and friends from Taiwan. Welcome to this discussion on the prospects for a deeper India-Taiwan cooperation in the evolving dynamics of the Indo-Pacific. We are holding this uh, live in partnership with the Chunghua Institute for Economic Research. I'm going to be brief, uh, just touch broadly upon uh, the theme before us today. Well, last year, 2020 was a difficult year. It was a year that reshaped the world in ways one could hardly have imagined, uh, you know, even one year ago. In many ways, this has also been the year which has brought nations face to face with profound transformations in the strategic landscape of the Indo-Pacific region. Actually, this was a transformation that had been unfolding over the course of the past few decades. But I think 2020 brought us face to face with it. 2020 has certainly been the year that has brought into much sharper focus the policy choices that confront countries such as ours in the face of a rising aggressive and menacing mainland China. We have found ourselves in an unfamiliar world where you know, to quote Yates, the best lacked all conviction, while the worst seemed to be full of passionate intensity. So countries woke up to the plight of multilateral institutions that were left beached and flailing. Worse was the very real possibility of their active co-option by nations that are not known to play by the rules. And people and governments actually confronted fear. A fear that has induced transformations that even today are tugging at some of our fundamental societal norms, our economic assumptions, our business principles, and the political arrangements of democracies as we have known them. Taiwan is in a different league. If Taiwan's economy held up better than most Asian countries, it was no doubt thanks to how well it handled the coronavirus outbreak. Perhaps the most important learning for the rest of the world emerging out of Taiwan was the systematic use of its digital infrastructure for healthcare. Taiwan showed the world how the key to avoiding massive, economically ruinous lockdowns was effective testing, isolation, and contact tracing. And of course, its electronic health record system, though not designed with the pandemic in mind, enabled a swift, targeted and effective response to COVID-19. It was the kind of response in a health system which most countries need to learn from. And Taiwan demonstrated beyond doubt that the PRC way of sharing information about the pandemic, as well as combating a spread, was not the only or even the most effective way. The pandemic revealed that many states as well as international organizations simply lack the information, the knowledge and the tools to respond. Taiwan, with a robust health system in place, came forward and shared with the world all possible information research. It leaned on the virus as it tackled it. It, it was remarkable the way Taiwan shared information. And Taiwan's open information sharing only underlines that international organizations such as the WHO whose mission it is to ensure the highest attainable standards of health for every person actually needs Taiwan more than Taiwan needs WHO. And it has not just been the pandemic. You know, mainland China's behavior in the extended region has raised legitimate concerns across nations in the region and developments across not just the states of Taiwan, but in other fast emerging hotspots, whether it be the South China Sea or Hong Kong, or the LAC across the Himalayas, they reveal a pattern. As the PRC's actions have become more belligerent, we see the emergence of an arc of convergence that is driving nations in the region such as ours, along with US, Japan, Australia, Taiwan and others, driving us together. Now add to these many ASEAN nations, Vietnam, Indonesia, and we slowly see this larger arc of convergence of strategic interests across nations. More than anything else, this is a convergence around the need for a normative world order. 
It is a convergence of nations coming together in the common and shared belief that the only way forward is a rules-based order that equitably and inclusively incorporates all and benefits all nations, large and small alike. The pandemic, yes, exposed the fault lines of multilateral bodies. It seeded the need for diverse, minilateral and plurilateral initiatives by the rising and middle powers in the region to ensure a stable, rules-based global order. One that would curb the excesses of large powers and engage with the opportunities that all of us offer to the region. And the one big difference this time round, the one big difference is that this art of convergence is no longer a construct located in Washington, D.C. It is a construct that is finding more and more active participation and dialogue between the regional powers, between countries such as ours. The time, therefore, is opportune for a stronger cooperation and alignment between India and Taiwan to work together to boost regional stability, strengthen the economic moorings of a world struggling to recover, helping by configuring, reconfiguring far more resilient global value chains to the benefit of all and not the few. So far, if there was one weakness in the construct of the Indo-Pacific, it has been that it has more or less been positioned by both its admirers and detractors as largely a security construct. The consequence is that for many countries across Asia and Europe, it falls far short of the alternative proposed by its main rival, which is the far larger Afro-Eurasian project encapsulated in the BRI. The BRI positions itself as a geostrategic and economic construct rolled into one grand narrative, one that brings with it the promise of the grand prize of the 21st century. Over the years, as a response, initiatives like the Blue Dot, the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, have seen the emergence of a vital second leg of the configuration of the Indo-Pacific. But there still remains a lot for us to do there. The pandemic exposed the fragility of existing global supply chains, and nowhere was this vulnerability better exposed than efforts to control the pandemic. China's continued reluctance in information sharing on even the origin of the virus forced many to, to relook at the manufacturing vulnerabilities. Now, this is no longer a matter of a competition to attract investments and production. It is more the need for greater security, resilience, and dependability on a much more diverse production network. And it is these aspects that you must work together, that, that you must tie in more countries to join in these supply chain networks initiated jointly by countries such as India, Taiwan, Japan, and Australia. Yes, 2021 has begun on a more optimistic note. We are not ready to declare V for victory yet, but V for vaccine has certainly brought some ray of hope. In a fractured world where even global cooperation in sharing vaccines is missing, and the World Health Organization's vaccine distribution plans were yet to get off the ground, India took a completely different approach. Its vaccine maitri, vaccine friendship campaign shipped hundreds of thousands of India-made vaccines manufactured under license from Oxford, AstraZeneca to some 60 countries. It is now set to be the hub for Sputnik vaccine manufacturing for the world. We believe that if Corona is to be defeated, we can only do it together. No one is safe until everyone is safe. We must come together to pick up the pieces and put ourselves jointly to the task of rebuilding a world still racked by the pandemic. Thank you so much. Chairman Sanjoy Joshi, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, first, allow me to warmly welcome all of you to the webinar on the prospects of a deeper India-Taiwan cooperation in the evolving dynamics of the Indo-Pacific. Although the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted us from meeting in person, we have still managed to organize this dialogue via digital platforms. To this end, I would like to express my sincere thanks to colleagues from Taiwan Exchange Study Centers, TASC, 
and India's Observer Research Foundation, or RF, for their smooth cooperation in making today's dialogue possible. Ladies and gentlemen, there is little doubt that 2020 was not an easy year for all of us. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken a heavy toll on the economy and society of every state. But both Taiwan and India have managed to go through this tough time. Despite its proximity to Manor China, Taiwan has done exceptionally well in the fight against the COVID-19 with low number of confirmed cases and death tolls. Meanwhile, in India, the number of active infection cases is declining. Plus, New Delhi has made huge progress in vaccine production and has kicked off vaccination program since mid-January. We wish to extend our congratulations to Indian friends on this and look forward to feasible cooperation between two sides in the near future. As you all know, Southeast Asia and India are represented as focal points in Taiwan's new South Bank policy, whereas cultivating intensive relations with Southeast Asian countries also lies at the heart of India's act East policy. Obviously, these two initiatives are substantially complementary, but more, both Taiwan and India break crucial laws in the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. For India, Indo-Pacific represents a free, open, and inclusive region that upholds international law, freedom of navigation and overflight, and sustainable development. As such, India has worked closely with the US, Australia, and Japan in recent years. For Taiwan, Indo-Pacific, this well with the scope of new South Bank policy, especially Taiwan's engagement with Southeast Asia, and India converges with the US national security and economic policy. Given this, both Taiwan and India have a number of motivations for seeking improved ties in the Indo-Pacific region. The Indo-Pacific region has witnessed some sweeping changes over the last few years due to the outbreak of US-China war, trade war, and COVID-19 pandemic. These changes have brought about both pros and cons for regional economies, including Taiwan and India. Disruption in the global supply chains raise alarm bells about excessive dependence on China market. But at the same time, this surprisingly created some dynamics for restructuring the supply chain in the region. With that in mind, this dialogue serves as an ideal chance for us to discuss prospects and measures to further strengthen cooperation between Taiwan and India in the context of these emerging dynamics. In today's dialogue, we invite well-informed speakers from India and Taiwan to share their viewpoints on two particular themes, India and Taiwan, assessment of the Indo-Pacific region and prospect of India-Taiwan cooperation to promote common interest and strengthen partnership in the Indo-Pacific region. I firmly believe that today's in-depth discussions will help to map up some specific policy directions to enhance our bilateral ties. Let me thereby declare the dialogue open and thank you for your kind attention. Let me begin by thanking uh, Mr. Joshi and uh, Dr. Chuang uh, Chang for uh, the opening remarks. 
as we move into the first uh, panel of the day, uh, we are looking at uh, over the next over the course of next um, hour and a half, we are looking at two panels. The first one is specifically aimed at uh, a broad strategic assessment uh, from both the Taiwanese side and the Indian side, and the next one would be more specific about potential areas for cooperation uh, where uh, India and Taiwan can work together uh, in the evolving dynamic of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and uh, and as we have heard from the two um, uh, opening remarks, uh, we know uh, the scale of change has been quite dramatic in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, not only in the last uh, last year, of course, uh, last year has been has aggravated and accentuated a number of the trends that were already visible. Uh, but uh, if if you are looking at the broad landscape of the Indo-Pacific evolving over the last decade, uh, it's remarkable how far we have come in a very short uh, period of time. The whole idea of Indo-Pacific now accepted uh, from Western Europe all the way to Pacific is itself, I think, um, in some ways a tribute uh, to the underlying logic of this idea, the underlying logic of how this maritime geography is uh, central relevance to the discourse on, on global politics and the fact that we are looking at, um, at the center of gravity of global geopolitics and geoeconomics shifting to a part of the world which at one point was being looked at very, very disjointedly. Uh, so uh, in that context, uh, um, we will be assessing in this panel uh, how, uh, what, what does it look like from New Delhi's perspective and what does it look like from Taiwanese perspective, the perceptions uh, about the region about this maritime space, uh, about this geography that is emerging, uh, and what what therefore um, uh, where those assessments converge, and what are some of the divergences which we can take to the next session and uh, explore in greater detail uh, the potential for cooperation uh, that might emerge uh, and that is already emerging in a number of areas and that can be further strengthened. So without further ado, let me invite Dr. Pramesha Saha for her opening remarks uh, and then I'll go to uh, Dr. Yi Chungla. I would also uh, request those in the audience uh, if, if uh, you know, you, um, if possible, please send us your questions, comments, and observations. We will be happy to take them um, over the course of this discussion. So, Dr. Saha, over to you. Uh, thank you, Professor Pant. Uh, I'll take off from where uh, Professor Pant just left, where he clearly mentioned, since this is a session which looks at how the two countries assess the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, I think there are two things which uh, clearly comes to mind when we go into this session is. Uh, the changes or the shift in the broad strategic landscape of the Indo-Pacific, that is one. And second has been the rising role or the growing realization of the important role which middle powers or rising powers can play in this broader Indo-Pacific dynamic which is evolving. So if we look at the strategic landscape or the shifts which has been, uh, which is visible from the Indian uh, lens, uh, we can see a clear change in India's attitude when we look at the Indo-Pacific. Yes, we do not still have an Indo-Pacific strategy. It is still an Indo-Pacific vision for India, which is inclusive, free, open, which is very much in line with the Indo-Pacific strategies and policies of all the countries, be it US, Australia, Japan. And even if you look at the new southbound policy of uh, Taiwan and even ASEAN's outlook on the Indo-Pacific. So it is broadly falls in line with the Indo-Pacific policies of all these countries. Um, but uh, the second uh, has been how active India has become in implementing this vision, especially in the last year. That can be attributed to uh, the crisis we faced at our border with China. We have seen a lot of initiatives or steps which has been taken by India, be it in inviting countries, um, be it in inviting Australia to join the Malabar exercises, which was uh, a long pending thing, which was uh, maybe for India's shyness uh, was not taking off uh, earlier. Uh, second would be even uh, how uh, now we have a leader summit. We just have had a leader summit at the Quad a uh, few uh, days back. Uh, before I go into that, even if you look at what has been India's stand on the South China Sea, we have come up with statements like the South China Sea is uh, should be looked at as global commons. We have entered into joint sail exercises in the uh, near the uh, uh, contested areas, near the which is claimed by the Philippines with countries like US, Australia. So there has been a shift also in in the way India is trying to implement its Indo-Pacific, be it in banning the Chinese apps looking at uh, establishing global uh, alternative global supply chain networks with countries like India, Japan, 
Australia, where it would be much better if other countries on the ASEAN and even East Asia, be it Korea, Taiwan, also join in. So there has been a shift in India's stand in, the, in those lines. Now to look at the importance of the middle powers. Uh, when I say middle powers and rising powers, essentially it is countries like uh, Taiwan, it is the uh, countries of the Southeast Asia and the recognition that these countries are uh, the role that these countries can play in this evolving dynamic of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, ASEAN now has an outlook on the Indo-Pacific. It may look like a very generic uh, statement, but it does lay out the areas of cooperation where it would like to engage uh, with countries like in, um, the four main proponents of the Indo-Pacific or even bring in countries like Taiwan in those uh, regards. Uh, and why am I saying this? Because Taiwan's new southbound policy, the three areas or the three countries that they would look to deepen their cooperation are India, Southeast Asia and also Oceania region. Taiwan has already been very active in, uh, in its diplomacy and uh, giving its economic assistance to countries in the South Pacific. That is one area where countries like India and uh, US can and even Australia can tap into because South Pacific is also becoming an important area of interest for all these countries. Uh, so these there are third uh, there are third countries where these uh, countries can also jointly, third regions, uh, where these countries can also jointly work, where Taiwan has already has a foothold uh, present. Uh, second would be uh, the changing at uh, the third would be the changing attitude of countries towards Taiwan. Also, if we look at the previous Trump administration, uh, there was a deepening defense cooperation with Taiwan, which was seen. Even if we uh, look at uh, India's attitude, there has been growing economic cooperation, which has been happening with Taiwan. Uh, Australia also, uh, when uh, there was questions about involving Taiwan in the uh, in the World Health Assembly meeting, there we saw countries like Australia, New Zealand, all championing uh, Taiwan's cause and saying that a country which has been so uh, successfully dealing with the COVID virus should be included in the uh, meeting itself to draw some lessons from their experience. So there has been a change in attitude towards Taiwan from these countries as well, which again lays the groundwork to deepen uh, the cooperation, which is the very aim of uh, this uh, webinar to look at areas. I will not go into the areas where India and Taiwan would uh, should work at, uh, should look at because that would be addressed in the next uh, session. Uh, but uh, besides these, I think uh, the these were the four main uh, points that I wanted to highlight uh, for this session. And uh, if we look at also, uh, I mentioned about the last squad meeting as uh, Mr. Joshi very, very clear uh, rightly pointed out, even in previous squad meetings or Indo-Pacific has essentially been looked at from a security as a security domain or under the security lens. But I think there has been a change in attitude in that as well. If we look at how the last Quad meeting uh, or even the joint statement, the spirit of the Quad, uh, which was uh, published at the end of the meeting, we see there are now areas where uh, these countries are looking to engage, be it in the uh, vaccine diplomacy or uh, global health governance in the supply chain in global supply chains or even in cooperation in critical and emerging technologies. Again, these are areas where Taiwan has a great hold over. So I think in bringing in countries like Taiwan in these areas of cooperation where Indo-Pacific is now looked at under a much broader lens, which I think we at the scholarly community has been have been proposing for a long time. But now that this has been recognized by the in the leaders summit, I think that again opens the door for countries like Taiwan to come uh, to for these countries to work with countries like Taiwan, Korea and others who are uh, leaps and bounds ahead uh, in this uh, in these fields as well. I think uh, with that I would like to end my comments and I would be happy to uh, take any questions at the end of uh, the session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saha. I think, uh, you know, uh, one point that comes out very clearly is uh, India's own assessment of the Indo-Pacific, India's own assessment of the role that Taiwan plays uh, in the region, India's own assessment of the areas for uh, partnership with Taiwan, India's assessment of uh, the shifts, uh, whether it is structural or institutional or normative in the Indo-Pacific has undergone a substantive transformation and that transformation needs to be acknowledged today uh, in, in building new kinds of partnerships that are not only oriented towards uh, practical solutions to practical problems, but also underpin the normative and institutional component of the Indo-Pacific that is just, just about beginning to emerge. Uh, and so the, the last year has been quite, uh, quite fundamental in that respect, but last year has built upon uh, some of the changes that were already 
already visible um, uh, you know to to observers of indian foreign and security policy towards the indo pacific uh, with that let me invite dr v uh, dr yi chang yi chung lao of president uh, prospect foundation from uh, of taiwan uh, for his remarks and then we can open it up for discussion uh, dr la yeah thank you <clears throat> thank you dr pen and uh, thanks for the observer uh, uh, observer foundation as well as uh, the uh, uh, TIER, uh, I'm sorry, CIER for inviting me to uh, join this uh, important panel discussions. Um, I think uh, I uh, agree uh, for hardly with the, our earlier presenters about her assessment uh, regarding the Indo-Pacific and how the Indians uh, viewed uh, those changes. And I also, the, uh, the following what I said was just basically to supplement uh, uh, according to my own observations about what the uh, uh, the changes and the situation around the Pacific will be. And I think we just cannot ignore uh, the kind of the pandemic uh, effect on the whole Indo-Pacific. But um, uh, there are certain uh, trends that the pandemic uh, sort of strengthen. There are also certain trends that pandemic has the, uh, uh, suppressed. And I think uh, it is important to view the pre-pandemic uh, era uh, what are the important trends, uh, at least in my view, uh, that, uh, that needs to be addressed? I think, first of all, definitely that is the Chinese aggressive behavior. Uh, China, uh, since year 2017 or 1617, uh, its aggressiveness toward these uh, neighbors as well as the in the world stages uh, has intensified. Uh, so that, uh, that also leads to the uh, big, uh, bigger pushback by other nations. And uh, one of the most important issues is that the United States has uh, readjusted its uh, strategic uh, strategy toward China, and that uh, we started to see that U.S.-China competition before the pandemic uh, was already in place and uh, uh, t intensified. And then associated with those is the reconfiguration about how the world industry as well as economic order will be. And one of them is that the supply chain issue has been brought up uh, to uh, a substantial degree for the rediscussions. And uh, uh, supply chain security or supply chain safety, uh, that, uh, that kind of discussion was in conflict, uh, basically in spirit uh, with the earlier, uh, when people, everyone is believing the free trade uh, interdependence world, and that's uh, the uh, added uh, element of the supply chain in the discussion. Uh, that also means that the, uh, uh, the world already started to rethink about how the economic order should be uh, even before the pandemic. And associated with those is the how the technology has been take, uh, taken uh, so seriously in terms of how the future will be. And uh, one of the main issues is that the technology, uh, security associated with the technology or the trusted uh, technology supply chain. And with that, the 5G uh, issues, in which uh, already uh, was a hot topic uh, between the United States and China, and as well as the US, uh, along with the EU vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, uh, that uh, was already in place before the pandemic. I think uh, those are the uh, the uh, most important trend I think uh, I identified uh, before the pandemic. And after the pandemic, some of them has been uh, strengthened, some of them uh, has been changed or the discourses uh, uh, altered. I think uh, when we talk about the, uh, the after the pandemic, definitely uh, one thing we, uh, we noticed that the, uh, the importance of the uh, uh, added importance about the trusted uh, technology supply chain. So that the supply, uh, definitely the, uh, the supply chain discussion has been strengthened even to a degree that how to uh, have a, a, a trusted and uh, actually secured a, sub, a global supply chain that become not only the, uh, the issue for the recognition, but also some action on for the target. And uh, associated with that uh, is the, um, in addition to the technology, uh, due to the pandemic, people also started to realize that the, uh, some of the uh, uh, essentials, uh, although they are not high tech, such as the medical, uh, medical equipment, and those are also the essential part of the uh, supply chain that needs to be addressed. I think later on, probably that will also extend itself into the, uh, the agriculture area where the food safety uh, could be another important issues uh, that uh, after the pandemic, that uh, people would uh, take that very seriously. All of those uh, sort of in, uh, sort of introduce a uh, re 
configuration or a different path about how the raw economic order should be and uh, uh, re uh, rethinking regarding the interdependence or basically the free trade uh, uh, principles about the economic principles. And that, uh, and that basically has uh, hit uh, the area on the Indo-Pacific uh, in a uh, very uh, important ways. Yeah, another issue I think uh, that uh, needs to be uh, talked about is that how the um, uh, political system uh, has been highlighted uh, uh, according to uh, how they uh, deal with the uh, pandemic. I think China, uh, after this pandemic, or still we're still in the middle of this uh, situation, China sort of take this opportunity uh, to launch a full speed and full uh, frontal attack against the dem uh, democracy as a political system uh, by highlighting how the Chinese uh, political uh, construct uh, was uh, was able and better manage the pandemic, was able and better uh, respond to the crisis. And then, and the uh, democracy, uh, especially when in China uh, lied to a contrast about the performances of the uh, major democracies, uh, the, uh, uh, the I think the challenge about the, um, uh, the so-called universal value uh, based upon a democracy right now is in a serious, uh, uh, legitimacy wasn't as uh, sound as it was before. So that the, uh, the value, political value itself, uh, after the pandemic becomes another very important uh, conflict areas. Uh, and uh, we have to uh, find out that uh, just right after the Cold War, where the universal value, the freedom, the democracy was considered to be uh, the winner. And the people even declared the end of histories that the freedom and democracy will be the ultimate winner in terms of historical spirit. But right now, it seems that the pandemic uh, introduced a different thought, at least from some authoritarian states, uh, based on what they perceive as the weakness of the democ democratic system and Western power, as well as the, the strength of their own economic uh, capability and the way they are able to manage the uh, pandemic. And certainly speaking, that uh, some of the country actually uh, subscribe themselves to uh, these line of thinkings, so that uh, we we are seeing uh, the bigger and the stronger conflict and intensified uh, today in the pandemic about the political values. Another issue is the um, after the pandemic, the uh, uh, economic corporations, uh, just as mentioned earlier, that the basic economic principles about the how the interdependence should be uh, that has been reconfig reconfigured. But uh, right now, the uh, uh, the future of the uh, world economic system, as well as how the economic uh, cooperation should be, I think that will be another area on, of the account uh, of the uh, um, the competitions. The uh, issue, of course, uh, when the people see the uh, um, the, the uh, finished negotiation about the RCEP, as well as China and the EU, this uh, about the uh, uh, comprehensive uh, invest, uh, investment agreements that uh, have been put in place. But the people also uh, question about uh, the validity and the legitimacy, as well as the sustainability of those economic agreements. And it is important to know that uh, before the pandemic, those economic uh, talk, uh, whether that is agreement or something, that was never been in such a big questions. It, it is just a matter of the uh, um, logistic, whether the negotiation can go through or not, but uh, about the basic principle, it was not uh, it was not in the question. But I think after the pandemic associated with all those questions, uh, that indicates the kind of the uh, uh, re economic principle rethinkings that people have. And I think one of the areas I've been hit most is in the Indo-Pacific. And then the next thing I think uh, 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 what we need to notice is that the pandemic also uh, put a bigger challenge about the um, uh, the political, uh, some, uh, some countries' political uh, system if they are fragile, and that this pandemic actually tested them uh, to a degree that some of the country even uh, experienced uh, the kind of the instability that they never seen before. Uh, specific in the Indo-Pacific regions, where we see the, uh, the, the problem in Thailand, uh, the recent development in Myanmar, and also the uh, problem uh, in the China man, uh, minister in Hong Kong, we all see the freedom regressed uh, in a degree that, that we never seen before. And also, 
uh, due to the uh, uh, Western democracies, they're, uh, they're so busy with their uh, issues themselves that uh, the, whole, the world respond to those uh, freedom regression in those areas uh, haven't been really been there. So that also add another dimension about uh, the problem that we are facing, especially here in the Indo-Pacific. Now let me turn to the, the biggest challenge and everyone knows about is about China. I think in China, the pandemic not only introduced uh, what China thinks about the world system, uh, the, even the remaining uh, trust about China as uh, the uh, responsible stakeholder uh, is long gone. Uh, after the pandemic, especially uh, the way that China uh, um, concealed this uh, information, uh, despite knowing that this uh, uh, intransparent uh, behavior will hurt uh, the kind of war in, uh, interdependence of the war system that we live in. But also, the China seems to uh, take the opportunity. Uh, this pandemic is introducing them a opportunity to regain uh, their uh, international status and uh, to shape uh, the international orders. We also noticed that the last year, uh, during the uh, fifth plenum of the CCP, uh, China has a, a fundamental different uh, different thinking regarding how the China interact with the whole world. Uh, from then on, China started to uh, highlight the domestic consumption as a main driver for their economic development from now on, and the uh, its connection with the whole with the outside will be uh, play a supplementary or the lessened role uh, for the future. And associated with those is the Chinese estimate about the uh, the Western democratic powers, and the uh, it seems to uh, it seems to many people that China is uh, suggesting that the um, uh, rising power uh, probably uh, it's the trajectory and the, the timing for it to surpass the uh, uh, dominant uh, status quo power uh, will come sooner than later. And there are the uh, 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 the years last year is the year 2028. Uh, that will be the year that China's Chinese uh, GDP will surpass the United States, and associated with the uh, uh, associated with that is the uh, strategic rethinking and uh, the attitude changes toward uh, from China toward United States. In the past, when the the United States is talking about the uh, status quo and how to maintain the status quo, and China basically uh, is um, taking uh, as a as a rule taker and uh, is. Trying, just basically trying to see how the uh, uh, the opportunity exists, whether they could uh, 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 find the loophole in it. But now China is uh, telling, including the United States, that uh, the this world would not be uh, as it is unless uh, China agree with it. And so that uh, I think the uh, in, this basically underlines many of the Chinese uh, very aggressive behavior uh, last year in the peak of the pandemic, including its uh, action towards Japan in the East China Sea and the bloody, con uh, the bloody conflicts uh, with India uh, <clears throat> last year, as well as intensified military harassment against Taiwan uh, since last year all the way uh, to this year. And all those indicates that the, uh, the Chinese attitude, not only toward its neighbor, but also toward the Western, including the United States, is very different uh, than the, uh, what it, uh, before the pandemic era. Of course, uh, the uh, associate with Chinese uh, change of behavior and the aggressiveness, uh, the, uh, the, this region also uh, started to come together. And that also highlights how the Indo-Pacific uh, become the uh, uh, could be become the center of the conflict as well as the center of the uh, uh, contention right now in the whole world. Uh, what we observe is that not only the Quad has been upgraded to the uh, the leadership meeting, but also the uh, the some West uh, European powers, including the uh, Germany, including the France, uh, even the uh, United Kingdom and uh, NATO himself. Uh, they all started to play uh, much uh, bigger attention to the Indo-Pacific region and they are acting upon it uh, so that uh, their presence in the Indo-Pacific region uh, will be uh, more uh, rather than less in the years to come. That basically highlights how the, uh, this region itself uh, uh, become the, uh, uh, the, uh, the center uh, for the older world attention. And among those, is the uh, uh, highlighted, uh, highlighted importance about the Taiwan and also how the uh, Taiwan Straits uh, play a central role in uh, the center of these Indo-Pacific conflicts. 
when we saw the Chinese military behavior, especially as concentrated in the southwest of Taiwan, we also noticed that this is exactly the area where the Taiwan Strait, Bashir Strait, and South China Sea uh, uh, congregate. Uh, so that that uh, the it seems to suggest that China already is playing the game where the uh, uh, its military uh, installations and the preparation in South China Sea, uh, there's a strong indication it is also a, uh, uh, they are preparing for the Taiwan Strait scenarios. And so that right now we are going to see that the weather of what's happening in Taiwan Straits is going to be, uh, uh, have a very strong indication about what China is, uh, will be doing in the South China Sea and vice versa. <clears throat> and, and that basically highlights how the, uh, um, the uh, strategic, uh, uh, strategic uh, contentions and the uh, how we are going to witness uh, the uh, conflicts probably in the uh, within the several probably five to seven years, uh, how this uh, will and how Taiwan will see uh, the increasing importance of it. And finally, I'll say that the um, uh, about the Indo-Pacific, uh, the Quad, uh, the leadership meeting, it seemed to suggest that the remake of the G7-like institution is going to remap itself in the Quad. So whether the Quad will become the G4-like of the G7 during the Cold War, and that is something that the people need to see. Um, and uh, that could that development of it could be a, uh, another ma uh, main driver for the, uh, the world politics, including the Indo-Pacific. So I'll just end up here and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yi Chungla. Uh, that was a quite comprehensive assessment of uh, Taiwanese perspective on a number of issues. I thought, uh, um, particularly, um, uh, you know, on on this aspect of uh, values and globalization, uh, which I think has is now becoming uh, the the drivers of the con kind of conversations we are beginning to have in the region. Uh, they seem particularly important, as well as uh, you know, you touched upon this aspect of uh, what Quad can potentially become or what is the potential for quad these are still early days uh, but i think the the assessment from um, you know uh, from your side was interesting to see uh, how, where you you thought it might end up and what role potentially it can play in the evolving architecture in the indo pacific i uh, would like uh, both of you to respond to a few things which i think it would be interesting to uh, to delve a bit deeper because i think it will have uh, some consequences for our uh, subsequent discussion on areas of cooperation uh, one uh, would be, uh, you know, uh, uh, I would uh, first invite uh, Dr. Saha and then uh, Dr. Ch uh, Yi Chung La. Uh, one, I think this 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 whole debate on on globalization and deglobalization, restructuring of supply chains. Uh, we have seen how important this is now. This is part of the Quad uh, agenda. Is this was part of the Quad agenda as well last week? Uh, we have seen how important uh, Indian Prime Minister said it uh, after uh, in the early stages of COVID-19. And the most important lesson that he has learned is that India needs to be self-reliant. We have seen similar sentiments being ex expressed uh, across the world in major uh, economic powerhouses. So what does it mean for economies like India and Taiwan in, in operational terms when you are looking at uh, you know, this uh, globalization, entering into a deglobalization phase, entering into this idea of selective globalization, fragmented globalization, uh, what impact potentially it can have uh, from both New Delhi's perspective and Taiwanese perspective, uh, in in terms of looking at uh, you know at the at the global economic order, uh, because both India has uh, and Taiwan have benefited enormously and have been very important uh, players in the larger global economic order. Uh, so how does uh, you know how how would how how will India how is India looking at this conversation and how is Taiwan trying to position itself uh, in, in that conversation because it will have important bearing on what Taiwan and India potentially can and or cannot do later on when we talk about uh, you know whether it is critical technologies whether it is about supply chains restructuring uh, it, it will have important implications there. So not going into specifics of cooperation I just want uh, this uh, you know, this your assessment. Uh, from uh, from two different vantage points about this this uh, you know this uh, new debate emerging in in our conversations uh, and it looks like uh, most countries most uh, economic players have bought into this idea that some kind of economic restructuring is necessary some kind of uh, you know looking inwards is necessary some kind of restructuring of supply chains away from china is necessary but it will have some consequences it will have some real time costs uh, and to what extent uh, are we looking at uh, you know india and, and taiwan 
bearing up those costs and do we have that space uh, in the global economic order where middle powers like taiwan and india can come together uh, and work on that that will be part of subsequent conversation of course but i just want you to elaborate a bit on your thinking as you're looking at it from uh, two different countries uh, looking at uh, you know the, uh, the, this phase of globalization morphing into something very very interesting and very very different from what we are used to so dr sai i'll go to you first uh thank you professor pant um, i think uh, the question if i have to answer about uh, restructuring of supply chain uh, networks i think uh, alone the middle powers can't uh, this is completely my opinion alone middle powers like uh, india taiwan um, it it will not be possible for them to alone pull this off and uh, completely rid of getting rid of economic dependence on china is also not possible there might be a relatively lesser dependence on china in the economic terms but completely doing away with that that will take a very long time and i don't think in the near future that is possible um, but as far as uh, this uh, restructuring of supply chain network is concerned i think uh, mostly this has been initiated uh, by the by india australia and japan and they have themselves also mentioned that they would need other like minded countries to join in as well but uh, it will be difficult to completely get on board countries like for instance uh, from the asean to say that this is an alternative to the uh, to uh, to a china economic dominated framework because again these are countries which are highly economically dependent on china how they would perceive of such uh, uh, alternative supply chain networks also remains to be seen because we have still not seen any um, asean countries join the network maybe they have expressed certain uh, positive uh, concerns positive responses but until and unless there are more countries joining in it would be difficult it is difficult right now to say what would be the future of such a uh, uh, network such as emerging uh, second would be fragmented globalization i think india's self reliance also uh, yeah we have been championing the make in india campaign and the atmanirbhar uh, which is which means self reliant in the essential uh, terms but again uh, we would need the cooperation of other countries if uh, not china in the uh, real sense but also other I, and i think that is where uh, mini lateral platforms like the quad comes in more than multilateral i think uh, as mr joshi and others have also pointed out that the pandemic did bring out uh in a bigger way the flaws of multilateral cooperation in those regards having such issue based uh cooperative frameworks be the quad or even such supply chain networks i think that because those will be more issue oriented there would be a proper target as to what these uh, uh networks are supposed to do in that way that would be a positive step but again until and unless more countries join in and what kind of a uh how to put this uh how would you lure these countries to join in these networks not just giving the china factor uh the face of it but provide but showing that there are other positives that can come out of these uh cooperative networks also has to uh, this is the thing that has to be worked out by the countries you cannot just put it as a reducing Uh, economic dependence on china mechanism there has to be much more which needs to be put in and that is where i think countries like taiwan which have already um, advanced in as i said critical technologies or even 5g networks those are the things which has to be brought to the fore i think the positives that all these countries have as we saw in the recent quad meetings that even when we are looking at the vaccine diplomacy which they are calling the last mile diplomacy it is the positives that each of these countries bring in how india's vaccine diplomacy has reached uh, to uh, many countries again usa and japan is looking to finance it australia is looking at its development financial and even logistics network to even uh, uh, send those vaccines to the countries in southeast asia and pacific so it is a positives that these countries are using which they have at their disposal the same has to do in the economic front as well it is a positives that these countries first needs to work out work out on and then put it forward as a proposal to the other countries to join in so it would be more of a let's say a reformed globalization rather than a fragmented globalization in that sense of the term i think uh, that is what my opinion is 
Um, uh, yes, I think definitely you pose a very challenging and very interesting questions. Um, <clears throat> But I probably uh, would take a different take uh, from the uh, uh, Professor Saha. And the uh, issue is that the, uh, when you talk about the supply chain reorganization earlier uh, in year 2017, actually uh, there was a, um, uh, it's a proposal actually from Taiwan a strategist uh, toward the United States. And of course earlier uh, it, uh, it was met with the, all the suspicion and doubts that, that this is not going to be possible and we just cannot identify those. And some of the, the US, uh, they, the, Specific, just uh, targeted how the uh, uh, the uh, Chinese presence in the uh, uh, military industrial uh, supply chain, and uh, decided that probably we could uh, just focus on that area. But later on, the supply chain discussion has uh, started to morph into other areas, not just about uh, not just on the purely military industrial, but also in other technology. And later on, uh, when we do the reassessment about the war technology. Uh, interdependence. Uh, what we found out is actually in the supply chain uh, is concentrated on, uh, uh, especially right now, on basically just uh, several companies. Now, some of the, the probably uh, less 10% um, of the, the company that uh, own probably 95% of the uh, international supply chain in their respected uh, area. And so to a certain extent uh, that uh, the reorganization and rethinking about how to design a supply chain seems to be easier than uh, what we thought it was difficult. So that, uh, that is uh, one of the first findings that, that we had uh, and after those years of discussions. And second, the SDEC technology goes, especially with the big data and the, the clouds, uh, and also probably in the future, the 3D printings, uh, the uh, deglobalization in terms of the manufacturers, that's going to be the, uh, the trend uh, and it will be intensified. So that uh, in terms of the uh, uh, manufacturer side, the, the globalization definitely is in decline. That's what is something that we know of. But then, when, uh, then we go into the issue about very added. Uh, how the uh, different design that could be there, uh, whether uh, that, but that, then the, there's a problem, uh, there's a question about, uh, we have the clouds that could uh, spread all the design uh, to the whole world, but they are also the uh, indigenous uh, requirement uh, associated with the patent and uh, so some of the domestic law, as well as the introduction of the, the personal data protection that also started to limit it, uh, the kind of the, uh, uh, the, the globalization in terms of the services that could be there. So I think there's a there's an up and there's a, a contributing factor as well as the restraining factors about uh, how the uh, sub, uh, globalization and uh, under the uh, uh, in terms of the service service trade uh, that will be uh, that will be in the future. So I think that uh, the the picture in my view is uh, not as uh, clear that the glo uh, deglobalization is not going to be there uh, or the end. no one is can be uh, cut off from China. Definitely no one can completely cut off itself from China. But uh, when we look at the Chinese uh, last year, their economic plan, they actually they try to lessen their dependence uh, to the whole world. So the uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, decoupling not does not happen in one way, it also happened from China about how they position themselves. And so the, uh, I, I do not have the clear answer, but uh, I just provide some of the observation and the interesting elements uh, trying to uh, end up in a discussion. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. No, that was very helpful. I think uh, it also showed uh, slightly different perspectives coming from India and Taiwan and perhaps where we need uh, more conversation on how we converge on this issue. Uh, before I conclude, I will just have one more um, thing to uh, to uh, raise here, um, both uh, to Dr. Saha and to Dr. Ichungla. Uh, I think uh, you know we have uh, there is an under uh, the the elephant in the room is China, of course. Uh, you know everyone is uh, if, if you are assessing Indo-Pacific, if you are assessing what potential can you know what potential exists for. Uh, India and Taiwan, countries like India and Taiwan to work together. You, there is an, you know, there we know that uh, you know that uh, China is is going to be there in some form, and we will we, will, we have talked about uh, we have talked a lot about China. But I think let uh, I, I just want you to reflect very very briefly because we are short of uh, time uh, before we move to the second panel. Uh, is uh, the other the other elephant in the room, which is uh, which is Washington. 
Uh, and uh, we have just seen a transition of power happening in the Biden administration. I would like to hear from, from Dr. Saha and from Dr. Uh, Ichungla about their own assessments about uh, you know, Biden administration. Uh, do we have a clear idea as to where their Asia Pacific or Indo-Pacific policy is moving towards? Uh, and what are you know what is the assessment now in New Delhi and uh, and in Taiwan based on two months uh, of Ms. Mr. Biden's in office and some of the things that he has done, uh, his administration has done and, and articulated. Especially, I think this week is very has been very important uh, because we are we have seen not only uh, last week Quad, uh, this week uh, uh, the two plus two dialogue with uh, Japan and South Korea, and later this week we will have U.S. China dialogue itself. So, what is the assessment coming from? Uh, the two sides, two countries, about the the changing landscape here, and and what what role America will play or potentially can play in this evolving dynamic of the Indo-Pacific. Very very brief comments from both of you, Dr. Sa. Yeah, um, thank you, sir. Um, I think uh, right since uh, even before uh, the Biden administration took has been a widespread speculation that uh, foreign policy in general might take a back seat with this administration because they have to uh, look after a lot of issues uh, at home. But I think uh, by the Biden administration, essentially they have uh, taken a lot of steps to show that Indo-Pacific will form an important pillar in their foreign policy. I cannot say if that would be the predominant pillar like it was for the previous administration, but it would be an important concern, uh, be it in the appointment of the Indo-Pacific coordinator or even in the last Indo-Pacific, uh, last quad leaders meeting. But I think uh, if one looks at the documents that was released by the previous administration, be it the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, report which came out, I think it was more of a Indo-Pacific being looked at from a security perspective. I think with the Biden administration, it would be more of an over encompassing view of the Indo-Pacific where security will be there, but there would be other issues like say climate change or even uh, as we were talking about supply chain, uh, uh, given the recent pandemic, uh, global health governance, these issues being addressed upfront as well. It will not just be simply a security or a defense perspective of the Indo-Pacific. It might be uh, 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 the overarching view, which also is very important because uh, China's advancement is uh, visible not just in the security realm, but in these other domains as well. So I think that is how uh, right now, later, uh, what would be the scenario is uh, difficult to predict currently, but at least seeing what the developments have been, I think uh, this government's ad uh, this administration look at Indo-Pacific from a much broader lens rather than a uh, strictly security perspective, which was what the previous government was more focused on. I think, yeah, that is my view. Dr. Dr. La? Uh, yes, I think the, uh, we do see the uh, continuity, uh, rather than discontinuity uh, of this administration uh, uh, in, uh, in comparison with the uh, Trump administration. So that the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy as well as a company vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, the, we, uh, a great deal of continuity is there. And uh, even they strengthen uh, the already uh, tougher uh, stance and toward uh, issue on like uh, China and the supply chain. And also the, some of the issues of human rights, they have been added a new an emphasis. I also believe that the uh, this administration in comparison with Trump administration is that uh, the uh, they will listen to what the allies and partners uh, are talking to them. Uh, the Trump administration basically is America first and want uh, the allies and partners to follow them. But the, uh, it seems that the uh, Biden administration uh, would like to consult with them first. And uh, uh, it had been shown in uh, whether the phone call, the uh, its relationship with the in, in, uh, European countries, and also the Quad, as well as the uh, its relation with the Japan and the Korea before they are talking to the China. So uh, I think that is uh, another important area, uh, whether it's discontinued, but it's a healthy uh, discontinuity there. Uh, thank you very much to both Dr. Saha and to Dr. Ichung La. We have, I think, uh, established a basic uh, framework uh, in terms of our assessments uh, where there is a great degree of convergence. 
Um, we have we have looked at uh, both uh, you know the structural factors, the rise of China, uh, the role of Biden administration, the role of uh, supply chain uh, shifting debate on globalization, uh, and I think we can already see that, uh, and we have been talking about this for a while now, uh, how the, the India and Taiwan potentially uh, have very very similar frame of reference through which Indo-Pacific is being viewed, the evolving dynamic in the Indo-Pacific is being assessed, uh, and therefore uh, it would be now interesting to go to the second panel and discuss specific areas where, where cooperation can manifest itself. Uh, so with that, uh, I will uh, uh, formally hand it over to Dr. Rajagopalan. Uh, thank you, Harsh, and good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the second panel, uh, looking at the prospects of India-Taiwan cooperation to promote common interests, strengthening partnership in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, I think the <clears throat> a clear basis has been set already. And I think uh, if when you look around, I think as China's relations with many countries uh, in the region and outside continue to deteriorate, uh, I think there has been a growing support for Taiwan. And I think this is you have seen it over the year, uh, over the past year when they, in the middle of the pandemic, <laughs> While there is very little to at the same time indicate that any country is considering dramatic shift to their Taiwan policy, uh, I think China's aggressive behavior, if it continues, I think that could generate uh, into growing concerns about a conflict. That is one particular possibility. And again, uh, this particular possibility, how does that particularly, um, uh, how does that change into transform into a more policy, concrete policy action? And I think that's what we are trying to see. So I think there is a lot of growing sympathy, growing support for Taiwan Taiwan over the past year. But I think uh, it comes from, of course, the Chinese aggressive behavior towards Taiwan uh, itself. I think that's the first point, the repeated military exercises in the vicinity of Taiwan, efforts to pressure Taiwan military. Uh, these are uh, these have been seen increasing number of cases over the years. And of course, I think in, in, in the case of China, uh, in the case of India, I think there is also the whole conditioning of the uh, provided by the COVID-19 pandemic and the Galvan clash, uh, killing of the with uh, killing of the 20 Indian Army personnel, which which again have created a fertile ground for um, some sort of a policy shift within the country. Uh, again, there has been a considerable anger and bitterness towards China again. But again, this is a point is how do we translate this into a concrete uh, sort of a policy action in terms of our approach towards Taiwan. Uh, and I think uh, there has been in in uh, in addition to all of this uh, uh, sort of a, uh, public anger as well as the some of the uh, elite opinion shifting within India. Uh, uh, this is also these are some of the shifts are also coming about because the result of China's heavy handedness, for instance, such as instructing the Indian journalists in October uh, that they should observe the India China uh, one China principle. Again, uh, this was triggered by reports and advertisements in the Indian media regarding Taiwan's National Day, for instance. So far from actually uh, winning any compliance, the Indian media dismissed this off, laughed them off, and the Chinese efforts at con trying to control the Indian media, for instance. Uh, and in Indian government clearly was less than amused by it. The foreign ministry spokesperson rejected the Chinese statement, saying that there is free media in India than the, that reports are on any issue that they, they can report on any issue that they see as fit and so on and so forth. So the growing sympathy in India towards Taiwan, including at official levels, is clearly uh, a result of the growing rift and the confrontational kind of approach between India and China that erupted primarily because of the uh a Galvan clash. Uh, there was even reportedly some consultations on the within the Indian government starting free trade talks with Taiwan again, but this seemed to have been uh, shelved for the time being. Uh, there is a contrast. This is a con contrast between India's attempt to curtail India's uh, Ch its China trade while seeking greater trade with Taiwan. That is pretty uh, strange and stark in a sense. But until the Galvan clash, India had not done much on the Taiwan front uh, in order to keep the China relations intact. But Galvan possibly has made uh, a good um, shift, possible shifts, uh, at least created the ground for some shift in India's calculations, strategy calculations. But I think uh, we should not be looking at just uh, Taiwan as a, just a Taiwan card that needs to be played every time there is a conflict or there's a potential uh, the ten increasing tension between India and, Tha India and China. But Taiwan has to be looked at as an integral part of the Indo-Pacific strategic uh, calculations. Taiwan should be looked at uh, um, as an important partner who can contribute to India's own growth story but also in the security uh, security realm. Uh, India could do a number of uh, things bilaterally as well as in the multilateral setting. Now, especially when uh, when you look at uh, India's role within the WHO, within the Executive Council, um, Governing Council and so on and so forth. Um, so I think there are, there are immense possibilities. But again, we don't know how this is all going to pan out. And I can only say that 
there are enough number of complementarities between India and Taiwan. So the potential for collaboration, whether it is in terms of including high tech, semiconductor industry, defense electronics, food processing, all of them are uh, enormous. And I think uh, Taiwan has been seeking greater presence in India for several years now. Uh, trade and investment have been seeing as favorable routes in pursuing uh, Tsai Ing-wen's uh, gov uh, government's uh, new southbound policy. Uh, uh, but India also needs to uh, loosen up some of the restrictions, incentivize the Taiwanese participation uh, in this regard. Uh, India has been reluctant primarily because of the China card, but I think there could be changes that are, that are coming about. Anyway, I would like to ask our two panelists to analyze the prospects of this relationship, identify possibly some of the areas um, where they, they could see some traction. Uh, along with the number of areas that we usually discuss, trade and investment, supply chain networks, science and tech. To me, one more area that could be uh, important is the uh, India-Taiwan collaboration in looking at the Chinese language studies as well as to understand China studies per se, because I don't think anybody else could be as uh, could understand China better than Taiwan, whether you want to understand the Chinese internal politics, the PLA, uh, which has been one particular area of concern, its internal dynamics, it, its international economic relations and so on and so forth. So I think uh, we have a lot to talk about. And of course, the language um, uh, is, uh, is another important aspect that could again India could take advantage of. Uh, now let me invite the two sp uh, speakers to uh, discuss these issues. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Sana Hashmi, uh, who's a visiting fellow that at the Taiwan Asia Economic Foundation, uh, which is a policy think tank that focuses on cooperation and exchange on Southeast Asian and South Asian affairs. Previously, she was the Taiwan fellow at the Institute of International Relations, National Chengchi University, and a non-resident fellow at Taiwan's Next Generation, the Next Gen Foundation. Our second speaker for this morning is Dr. Uh, Roger Liu. Uh, Roger Liu is Associate Professor of International Politics with the Department of Social Sciences at the Flame University. Uh, again, both of them are very, very, uh, they have a very comprehensive uh, sort of a detailed CV along with their publications. But in the interest of time, let me just go to uh, the two speakers right away. Uh, over to you, Sana, first. Um, thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Raji. Uh, and thank you for having me here in this webinar. Uh, so uh, speakers in the previous session have already given us a broad framework of how India and Taiwan are placed in the Indo-Pacific region. So um, as far as India's position vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan is concerned, I'm of the opinion uh, that India is still weighing its uh, options and pros and co cons of elevating ties with Taiwan. And uh, the interest has certainly grown over the past few months. And it is also clear that India is not too cautious about engaging Taiwan anymore. Uh, so my first observation here is that India-Taiwan relations are moving out of the clutches of India-China ties. And this is a good development, but we must also keep in mind that India-Taiwan ties will still be impacted by the China factor. This is a, a point which has been brought up by previous speakers as well. So one of the most important phases for Taiwan's foreign relations came during the difficult times of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it somehow sharpened the contrast between the PRC and Taiwan. Um, as if they are two opposite sides of a spectrum. So on one side, you had Taiwan, which had a compassionate president and her team, proactive and advanced healthcare system, and minimal number of COVID cases. Uh, Taiwan still has less than 1,000 cases, and most of the cases are imported cases. Um, and on the other hand, you had the PRC, whose image only got worsened with surfacing of hundreds of videos where police were seen forcefully putting people away from, the, from, from their families. Uh, so the biased inquiry by the WHO and then China's covering up of the pandemic only damaged the PRC's reputation while also giving people a chance to understand uh, how different Taiwan is. Uh, so the COVID-19 pandemic also led to a greater awareness and discussion about Taiwan in India. And the development was noticed, particularly at the civil society level. So while those were positive developments, uh, the potential of the relation still remains underutilized, in my opinion. So even though the representative offices are there in each of the capitals, and also in India, we have uh, uh, as an, another representative office in Chennai. Uh, to the, so these offices are there to manage the relationship, but the relations still lack a concrete framework. Uh, so while the Simon administration uh, has come up 
now with this India is clear on engaging India now with, through the new South Bond policy. So since 2016, there's a policy that includes India as a key focus country. And when we talk about India Taiwan relations, we talk about different aspects of relation, but we don't really emphasize enough on the new South Bond policy. So I know the China factor still looms large over the prospect of India Taiwan relationship, but if we just follow and attempt to bolster ties within the framework of the new Salman policy, I believe this is going to be mutually beneficial. Uh, so enough importance has not been given to the fact that Taiwan, whose foreign policy till some time back was very America centric, it now has a policy for countries in the South Asian region. So unlike previous iterations of the ghost of the new southern policy, the go south policy, the new southern policy is just not focused on the ASEAN region, but also on Australia, New Zealand and six South Asian countries uh, of which India is the core component. So under President Tsai ing -wen government, the focus is on expanding cooperation in a wide range of areas with countries that were traditionally not on Taiwan's radar. So it is unprecedented that Taiwan has a policy to engage six South Asian countries that weren't traditionally a part of Taiwan's wider scheme of things. Um, so I believe that it is important that Taiwan's bilateral relations should no more be viewed only through the China lens. I know it is difficult, but I think we can start from uh, this reference point. And this is one of the major features of the new South Bond policy as well. So the focus is just not on reducing the dependence on China anymore, but at the same time, it is about reaching out to countries for, the, for mutual benefit. So uh, India's preference to manage ties with China has kind of led India to ignore Taiwan for a very long time now, but the recent developments have changed India's policy and as well as approach towards China and as well as Taiwan. So India is well aware that the boundary dispute is no more about the differing perception and China has no interest in maintaining the status quo. So while the dialogue for a hope to achieve a breakthrough in the dispute is on, India is also exploring other options. Options, And the recently concluded Quad Leader Summit is a case in point. Uh, so I believe the time, this is the ap appropriate time. This The time is right to devise a synchronized strategy to engage each other. The two sides need to take a step further. And Taiwan also needs to be a little more proactive with India. And what India has to do, it has to carefully nurture its engagement with Taiwan while still keep adhering to the one China policy. Um, and also what we have to keep in mind that not everything is about the one China policy anyway. So there are hundreds of non-controversial areas where we haven't even initiated a dialogue. And all this can come before we head towards the security uh, alignment kind of a thing. So higher education, especially in IT, engineering, biomedical field, aeronautics, other health sector degrees such as nursing, etc. And also Mandarin uh, language training. These are the potential areas which we have to really look into when we talk about India-Taiwan relations. Uh, so to give a few policy recommendations, I believe that it is important uh, for both sides to focus on the economic aspect of the relations and Dr. I, Lai Aichung has already talked about the economic aspect of the relationship, also the prospect for the uh, free trade agreement. So this is the area where India's main interest lie. So, but I believe that even though India is interested in elevating economic ties, even this is the area that has remained underutilized till now. So there was a feasibility study done uh, for the free trade agreement uh, by uh, which was announced by Ambassador Nirupama Rao when she was a foreign secretary in 2011. And the study was carried out by India's ICRIAR and Taiwan CIER. ER. So I think it will be beneficial to have such more uh, sector wise feasibility studies in the current scenario. Uh, but what is more important is that that we put these into practice. And it is more important that when India has made it clear that it will not be a part of the Belt and Road Initiative in its current form, it might be useful to look towards Taiwanese companies and encourage them to take up projects in different parts of India. So also products made in Taiwan are far more superior than the Chinese products, and it will be mutually beneficial if a more sustained focus is given on economic ties. And I was listening to this interview by uh, Taiwan Foreign Minister Joseph Wu, and he actually uh, gave a very vital piece of information fact that uh, Taiwanese companies in India, there are more than 100 Taiwanese companies in India, and these companies employ 65,000 Indians in India with a, an accumulative investment of more than 2.8 billion. So my second recommendation here would be that, that there's a need 
for us to build a greater case for the people to people ties. And this is the thing which I have been advocating for for a very long time now. I think even before we as scholars, academicians talk about economic ties and other things, because as I have said that India's main interest lies in the economic sector, but we also need to equally focus on the people to people ties. Uh, so the number of tourists visiting each other's countries have never crossed 50,000 each year. And I think this is a very shocking fact about India and Taiwan when we talk about tourism and people to people ties. So there have been several efforts by the Taipei city and also the new Taipei city government to attract Indian tourists to Taiwan after the pandemic gets over. Uh, so there were there have been videos that were released and government sponsored cultural activities that have been organized in um, Taipei and in the new Taipei city. So it is mostly in Taipei. So this is one area where I think both sides really need to invest the resources. Uh, then third, I think it is very important and logical for scholars in India and Taiwan to reach out to each other and emphasize on the need to increase the level of interaction. We need to have more scholarly discussions like this. And we also need to have greater institutional cooperation between Indian and Taiwanese think tanks and universities. So uh, I think when India has to look towards any other country, I believe the Singapore is already saturated with the presence of uh, think tanks and Indian scholars. I think it's really overutilized and China is not preferred for obvious reasons. Now, several European think tanks are opting to come and establish think tanks in Taiwan. So why not an Indian think tank? So I think it's very important that Indian uh, think tanks actually look towards Taiwan now. Uh, also, uh, it is very shocking to me that no Indian journalist has been stationed in Taipei. So you have several correspondents stationed in Beijing, and then the journalist community has written dozens of books trying to understand China from their own point of view, but not a single solid attempt has been made to even familiarize with Taiwan. So this must change now, and media interactions and engagement play a critical role in generating awareness about a country and Indian media outlet may also consider sending correspondents to be stationed in Taiwan. So more awareness about Taiwan as a lucrative destination for think tanks, for media outlets is very important at the same time as Dr. Raji also uh, recommended that it's very important for Indian students and professionals to learn uh, about the prospects of Mandarin language learning in Taiwan. I think there's lack of awareness, lack of information that has been there. There have been several scholarships and fellowships which are offered to Indian students and professional, I, but the problem is there's lack of awareness about such programs. So regular exchanges at the academic people to people and media level are mutually beneficial and should be promoted. Uh, so I think it's webinars like these uh, which contribute a lot in developing mutual understanding and appreciation. And I really thank ORA for taking the lead here. So I strongly believe that the people to people ties have the potential to be translated into political uh, actions and um, uh, but having some kind of understanding at the government uh, level is also very important. So one way is to establish a policy planning dialogue mechanism. So MEA's policy planning is one of the strongest divisions uh, with the understanding of global affairs. So even if it's not possible to have a policy planning dialogue at the senior official level, a dialogue at the director or junior level may be considered and established at later stages. So there's so much potential, especially in the cyber domain. So India has a robust cyber, uh, India has robust cyber cooperation with countries across the world. And Taiwan is one country that faces several cyber attacks in a day, much more than an average uh, average cyber attacks any country faces in a day. So this will be a very important field of cooperation for India. Uh, now coming to health cooperation, everybody talks about health cooperation and this has this has actually become an important component of the Indo-Pacific now. So Taiwan and India's external COVID-19 policies have been complementary and inclusive. Uh, so while Taiwan has successfully curtailed the COVID-19 at home, it has also helped the countries in need by donating masks and also PPE kits. So India is also taking leadership role through the vaccine myth remission, uh, supplying vaccines to countries in the Indo-Pacific region and beyond. So such inclusive policies have been at the core of the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, so I believe that very important that both countries look at cooperation in the health sector, and this would actually help solidifying the rules based order further. Um, then India may also explore the possibility of cooperation under the global cooperation and training framework. So um, US, Japan and Taiwan they are cooperating under the framework of the GCTF and UK also recently held a workshop with the GCTF. So this is a platform for Taiwan to share its expertise with partners around the world. And I believe if India looks towards that, it is going to be mutually beneficial for both countries. Um, 
Now, coming to the Indo-Pacific, Taiwan is a crucial part of Indo-Pacific region. This has been highlighted by the previous speakers as well, and a multilateral and collective effort is needed to include Taiwan in this evolving regional order. So, despite Taiwan's willingness to be a part of this international architecture, its role in the international system has been overlooked till now. So its position and overall standing in the international system has rather been marginalized. It hasn't been given its due uh, and it's primarily because of the domination that China has exercised for a good number of decades, particularly since 1972. So over the years, Taiwan has flourished as a strong democracy and has a robust system of rule of law and governments in Th Taiwan are now democratically elected and over the years successive governments have shown that they are answerable and responsible to the social, political and economic demands of the people and this was also seen during the COVID-19 handling of the government. Uh, so the idea behind the Indo-Pacific is to maintain the equilibrium and make sure that the rules-based order is preserved and the hegemonic tendencies are counted in a timely, timely manner. So much depends on how Taiwan is positioned in the Indo-Pacific region. Taiwan will become an important beneficiary and will in turn further strengthen the idea of the Indo-Pacific region. So this is not because the Indo-Pacific region is uh, perceived to be something that is against China. It, is, it shouldn't be perceived as an anti-China coalition, but it is based on the fact that the Indo-Pacific advocates for an open, rules-based and inclusive regional order. So this is important on several counts, but the most important being that if region is going to be uh, the rules-based uh, region and then Taiwan's participation as an entity which is geographically located in the Indo-Pacific region is very important. So Taiwan's policy in this region is actually complementary to other countries' approaches as well. So the new Southern policy fits well in this context and with the ASEAN region at the core of several countries' Indo-Pacific uh, 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 policies, Taiwan has played an important role as a trade investment partner to uh, several countries including the ASEAN member state. So India too can benefit from Taiwan's advanced economy that can help India in critically important sectors. So I believe Taiwan's participation is important not only for Taiwan's international standing but also for India's own vision of the Indo-Pacific order. And to make the Indo-Pacific truly inclusive, open and rules-based, Taiwan's participation should be strongly encouraged. And it shouldn't just be by one country, it should be a collective effort by the like-minded countries. So it should be actually promoted by uh, countries such as India, Japan, Australia, and also the like-minded countries in the ASEAN region. Uh, so to conclude, I would say that Taiwan has a light but a strong military and economically it is very strong. And if India does not engage Taiwan right now and continues to overlook Taiwan's potential, it is going to be a missed opportunity for both Taiwan and India. And engaging Taiwan and making, making it a part of India's long-term strategy will only strengthen India's positioning in the wider region and also serve India's economic interest. I will stop here. I welcome questions. Thank, uh, thank you, Sana. This is uh, that's very, uh, very, very comprehensive, and uh, you brought out a very uh, good number of points, uh, which I want to come back to. But let me, at this stage, uh, give the floor to Roger, and then I'll come back to both of you with some questions. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Roger. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Raji, and uh, I, I first I would like to thank um, CIER and uh, the Observer Research Foundation and the introduction of um, uh, Minister uh, Mu Min Chen uh, for this opportunity to participate and to interact with all the old friends and new friends here. Um, so I would like to start with um, the question that led by Dr. Pans. Um, regarding the uh, perspectives of the future uh, India-China and uh, India-US relations, I would say that, well, the current situation is still very uncertain. We are still, um, it's, we were still yet to see what the US-China policy is going to be, although they have been, you know, there are a lot of words um, regarding how they are going to continue the um, um, all the uh, sanction like um, or all the multilateral um, checking of the China's rising power in the Indo-Pacific region. But I, I will say that, um, well, the whole situation is still uncertain because there are at least two points. First, uh, the current liberal government of the US under um, Biden actually has expressed its concerns about India's political development recently. You will see that Daniel Dresner or other uh, liberal um, scholars expressing 
uh, their worries and their suspicions about the perspectives of the future India-US uh, cooperations in the framework of Quad. Um, and the second thing is that we still yet we are still yet to see the development of future U.S.-Russia relations, which will be also be a key element between uh, India-U.S. relations as well. Because oh, well, one of the tri big triangles that India uh, has relied upon, the BJP government has been relied upon, is the RIC, the Russia-India-China triangle, and we need Russia to check upon China as well. But now, as we see uh, the coming back of the Obama era officials like Victoria Newland and others, um, there is an uncertainty here. And the final thing is that um, there is a different style. Well, if Donald Trump is the, the box starts here, then Biden is to passing out the box to the allies. So um, we are still yet to see what China will do to these allies after the U.S has uh, initiated its first move. So still many things are yet to be seen. So that comes back to the important points that I'm going to make, which is we are, we should focus more on India-Taiwan relations itself and the strengthening of the bilateral relations um, and focus more on that to make sure that no matter what happens, India-Taiwan India relations can sustain itself at maximum. Uh, India-Taiwan relations should be re reform reformulated and re-narrated, and it should not be just a temporary role, or it should not be viewed always as a card that whatever <coughs> happens between Beijing and New Delhi, the China is Taiwan is going to be played as a card. Um, we have to build up um, a more strengthened India-Taiwan relations. And by doing that, there are several things that I would like to uh, focus upon. The first thing is that we need more new narratives um, between the two countries in the uh, bilateral relations between India and Taiwan. Well, speaking of the new narratives, this is not just a metaphysical issue. Actually, that is for a new imaginations or new thinkings that we can between these two countries to reformulate some ideas that we have been thinking about. One example that I want to give you is if you have the experience of taking students or the Indian um, delegations or delegates to visit TECC several years before, you will notice that when they try to introduce the relations between India and Taiwan, they always begin with the relations between Chiang Kai-shek government and, and, and Gandhi. So everything just becomes, um, everything just begin with the new old narratives from there. And um, I think now Taiwan, since Taiwan has endured um, many years of democratic transitions, we have to reimagine the relationship and to rediscover the histories between the two countries. For example, Chandra Bose and his death, his suspicious death in the in Taipei airport is something that nobody has been talking about. Um, other uh, pieces of um, histories between India and Taiwan, especially after the democratization of Taiwan, should be something that we have to look at. <coughs> because by looking at that, we can not only have new imaginations or new strategic uh, guidance of the, the big plans between the two countries. We, it also helps to discover new topics that we can study all together. For example, the democratization is something that, bring, that can bring India and Taiwan all together. For example, the historical studies to discover new histories um, is beyond purely academic things. By creating new stories, we are creating more opportunities for practical interactions. We are creating more opportunities for travel and tourism. We are creating more visitors from different aspects, from different areas of studies to, to visit India and Taiwan from both sides. So these are very important. I think the first thing is that we should have new narratives and new imaginations. And the second thing about the new uh, thinking is that 
one china policy um one china policy is something that uh people like to talk about and view as a hindrance between the development of re bilateral relations between india and taiwan but actually no one has i mean not very few people know about how it is practiced and um, how it actually form an hindrance between the two countries. Um, we can notice that um, within especially the practice of uh, the diplomatic relations between the two countries, one China seems to play a role here. Um, participants of meetings like that will receive the guidance from the government agencies like you cannot mention this and that. And this is the practice in one China policy. And under this, actually, we can look at the details to create more spaces to see we should sit down um, and use more occasions like what we're doing now to check the details of how China policy, one China policy actually has influence the relationship between and, and the practice between the two countries. And I think that's very important. Um, one interesting thing to, to notice is that India seems to have its own China policy and it has been reflected. If you remember the examples that last year when China asked the major airlines of the world to change Taiwan to subsume Taiwan to be a region, a province or a city under China. India actually has its way of doing things. India used Chinese Taipei. So this not only reflects uh, um, our uh, pensions to the multilateralist um, traditions, but also it shows a way that India can stick to its own policy. And we have to, I mean, from the Taiwanese perspective, it's important to look at this policy and make sure that does not sway too much from the center. And um, another thing that I would like to talk about is that, um, um, well, recently Vijay Gokhale, he shared uh, one idea in um, one of the webinars that um, about the, the post govern situations. He mentioned about Taiwan. He said, uh, Taiwan should be a business. That India should care about. Not a strategy, but a business. The reason why um, is that um, there are 40% of the trade of India between India and East Asia pass through the Taiwan Strait. So Taiwan, although Taiwan has been recognized as a, or formulated by the Chinese side as a core interest, well, India can still create a space by redefining and by carefully uh, crafting the space um, when they are um, doing their diplomatic um, works with China. So how can we create such a space and try to um, expand more space like that is something that we can think about. Um, if we can craft it, if we can craft a new space, then we can push for um, in more areas. For example, um, what, what, one example is um, currently, the U.S. Uh, uh, State Department has an initiated idea that um, the U.S. Um, civil servants can receive their trainings in Taiwan. So the diplomats or um, uh, the, the, the bureaucrats can be trained in Taiwan uh, under different programs. I think this is something this may sound like a bold idea, but I think this is something that we can think about. It can go under different names. It doesn't have to be government to government, or we can just play down the government taste. But we can thought we can think about um, uh, these uh, opportunities or these um, um, potentials. This is one thing. If um, we can make more bureaucrats or um, civil servants in the Indian governments from all levels to know more about um, Taiwan, that will help to promote the bilateral relations. And the second thing is that we have to make more meaningful infrastructure to go first, then the superstructure will follow. 
because from the um, if we depart, if we look at everything from the government uh, perspectives, for example, um, the MOFA of Taiwan, they will have, they, they might have because of their KPIs or you know the the policy requirements, they may focus on some uh, political related tasks or things. But uh, from the other side, I think it it makes much sense that we create such a meaningful connections first, and then this uh, meaningful con connections can spill over to higher political areas. Uh, for example, one example is the space program. Um, of course, the space authorities of both India and Taiwan can make contact with each other and try to come up with some uh, programs that they can work together. But at the same time, the Taiwanese business and the Indian business should also explore the possibility that maybe they can begin with the startups at the bottom to explore whether there are some micro space programs they can do in Bangalore and other spaces in the form of star startups or entrepreneurship. We can create opportunities not only in politics, but in business as well by doing that. And this is one example that I would like to mention. Uh, the second thing that I have noticed um, in the uh, interaction between India and Taiwan is that we focus a lot on hardwares, but there are some softwares that we can do. Um, the, Jap the Japanese and the Chinese have been established the consultancy firms that helps their own business to enter the Indian market. And this should be an option that the Taiwan um, should, should think about um, because um, the connections in the Shinju uh, science, science Park and um, um, ICT industries in India has very strong. And there is also a rising need for legal services, for business consulting services. And we can bring this opportunity in. We can encourage more lawyers in Taiwan. We can encourage more um, financial uh, professions in Taiwan to engage in the Indian business. And this will not only help um, the Taiwanese business to expand in India, but that will also help to build the capacity, the international capacity of the Taiwanese financial and legal experts. And I think that's very important. And this has been done by the Chinese and the Japanese for a long time. Um, there are some um, potential areas that Taiwan and India can work together. Uh, including some of you have uh, talked about uh, the space program is one thing, uh, cyberspace, um, the cooperation in cyberspace related things like cyber attacks or cyber terrorism, all these sensitive but important rising areas that India cannot work with China is the opportunity of Taiwan. And this is what Taiwan had, has been good at. Taiwan has much expertise in. So we should um, focus and explore the opportunities in areas like that. And one of the areas and that I have to think about is that Taiwan actually can be uh, a transitional role between India and other Western countries. One example recently is that you might read from the news that um, the news from yesterday that um, recently uh, think tanks like the Freedom House and the BDM has been uh, downgrade the India um, dem democracy levels. And uh, the Ministry of External Affairs actually is thinking about the opportunity to have its own world democracy report as well as a global press freedom index to be done by an independent Indian think tank here in India. And I think why not Taiwan can play a role here? Because Taiwan has been a model student in democracy. Taiwan's democracy has been working really well. And speaking of, um, well, Taiwan's democracy has been consolidated for years. And in, in many aspects, we have been doing much better than the United States and the Western uh, predecessors. 
And what's more important is that when Taiwan had, if Taiwan chooses to work with India in democracy, India won't feel threatened. India won't feel dictated by a Western power. And Taiwan has already experiences working with East Asian countries, uh, Southeast Asian countries that have similar uh, set political settings. Well, even if speaking of authoritarianism level, actually India is much better to work with, right? So um, I think this might be an idea that we can try. If Taiwan and India can work together on um, a project like that, I think there is um, a great potential for that. And um, I would like to conclude uh, my points here that um, um, I think India, it, it's time for India and Taiwan to build up an all weather relationship which means that no matter how um, Sino-India relations alters, or no matter how um, Sino-American uh, relations um, goes, the relationship between India and Taiwan should remain stable. And we should look things in long terms. And um, Taiwan should uh, avoid being played as a card or appear in the narratives as a card and um, only by doing that, actually, we will have a more stable bilateral relations. And I think timing is the key. Um, there, are, there are a lot of talks happening in the town, no matter where they are. But um, I think the key area is, well, based on the, uh, my observation and my experience for the past few years, I think uh, things are done by the people, by the real persons. So um, first, we have to grab the timing for now because, well, we don't know what will happen between India, US, and uh, um, China for the future. It's, it's volatile. So timing is the key. If we want to do it, we, we have to do it now. The second thing is that we have to identify the key persons who, have, who are willing and who have the capacity to do that. And this, I will conclude from here and then to see, uh, I will take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roger. Uh, I think we are almost completely out of time, but I want to take the opportunity uh, to raise a couple of important issues because you both have talked about how we can further the relationship between the two. Uh, you have looked at very uh, two different sets of areas. So, Sana, to start off with, uh, you did say that uh, we need to not look at the security aspects uh, as the primary driver for the relationship and that we need to look at people-to-people uh, -people, uh, ties, higher education sector, sector-wise economic uh, uh, tie-ups uh, tie ups through feasibility studies and so on and so forth, uh, tourism and so on and so forth, think tanks, scholars, exchange, all of them absolutely very valid. But now that India is making some push uh, in terms of expanding the collaboration, pushing uh, away its shyness in engaging in some of the uh, uh, military engagements with other countries, whether it is the Malabar inviting uh, Australia last year, uh, next month uh, India is going to be engaged in the Quad Plus, uh, including France in a uh, naval exercise, um, uh, UAE, and a whole range of countries. So Quad Plus itself is, is gaining a lot more traction and with a lot many more European countries coming into the Indo-Pacific. So there is, a, there is a sort of a, I think the time is right now, it's somewhat more conducive to expand the horizon, expand the kind of po possibilities uh, and uh, engage in some sort of a naval engagement. My question is, can there be even a minimal sort of engagement with Taiwan? Maybe something as minimal as a PASEX, which is the most minimal form of engagement between two navies, for instance. Uh, is it time for India to start looking at very, very minim, uh, limited engagements? Uh, is intelligence collaboration between the militaries of the two countries within the uh, realm of possibilities? Uh, how do you see information sharing intelligence as well as a very minimal um, military to military exercise something like a passage as a possibility between India and, uh, India and Taiwan, in a sense. Uh, Roger, the, uh, you can also ask that, uh, respond to that question, but you also highlighted the democracy, which is an important aspect between the two countries. Um, uh, India, Indian democracy is somewhat sometimes very chaotic and loud, uh, but it's still a democracy. But I think 
uh, rightly so, there have been some criticism in recent times uh, over the last uh, year and a half or so uh, as to where India stands on its democracy credentials, uh, freedom of the press and whole human rights related issues and so on and so forth. But I want to tie in that as well as another uh, point, uh, in, in fact, uh, flowing from the first panel where we talked about as to how China made a, a lot of effort highlighting democracies as ineffective governance structures in managing and pan, uh, curbing the pandemic spread and so on and so forth. But there are a lot of successful examples of Taiwan uh, uh, democracies that have managed the pandemic so 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 very effectively, whether it is the, take the case of Taiwan, New Zealand, South Korea and so on and so forth. So can there be a coalition of democracies to push do some pushback on this? But Again, if you're going to do a democracy coalition, then you're also going to leave out possible uh, strategic partners like Vietnam in a sense. So who have actually actually also managed to keep the infection and fatalities under control during the pandemic. So there are these uh, multiple uh, kind of uh, uh, conflictual points that come into play. One is the co democracy coalition. But second, the point you wanted to highlight is the how India and democracy can, uh, India and Taiwan can uh, highlight their role as uh, you know flourishing democracies. Uh, yeah, there are some question marks around there. I think there are some issues out there. So I don't know uh, whether we would want to go down that path. So let me uh, leave you with these two questions, given that we are completely over the time limit now. I think um, speaking of the uh, security cooperation, collaboration, we can think of, we can, there are some new development that we can look at. Uh, maritime is one growing area that will create um, needs. Um, one example is that Taiwan has been expanding its diplomatic relations in East Africa, in Somalia, Somaliland. And um, this, is, this, this creates the, the space between um, the co space of co collaboration between the Indian and the Taiwanese navies. Uh, there are many things which can be done, but not be said in details, but we can use our imaginations to, to focus on that. Um, the, Fisher, uh, fishing uh, collaborations in the Indian Oceans, um, uh, maybe in the multilateral collaboration, I mean, organizations that India has been a host. Maybe there's some space for Taiwan as well. We, we, we may explore a little bit about that. So this is one thing. And second thing is that I think Taiwan, like um, Sana have mentioned that, or um, uh, other panelists has mentioned that, um, <clears throat> Well, we have to be more proactive sometimes. I mean, uh, from the Taiwan side, uh, when it comes to all kinds of collaboration, sometimes there's a lack of, you know, fighting or identifying the key persons who can actually uh, carry out this mission. And then this is something that we have to think about to to look for more uh, interesting, interested and capable figure and the key figure to play their roles in the interactions. And for the democracy, and thank you for your um, comments on that, I think uh, the, the flexible role that Taiwan can play is very important here because Taiwan has been dealing with Southeast Asian countries. And as you know, Vietnam, Singapore, Myanmar, all these countries were under the uh, definition of Western democracy. None of these countries are democratic. And when Taiwan has been dealing with these countries, Taiwan has learned how to um, make sure that its benefits, its interest has been uh, guaranteed without uh, angering the governments in that region. But at the same time, we can push for uh, meaningful collaborations. So I think by doing that, we have to focus on different parts of democracy. We have we have to try to redefine democracy in different settings. Uh, Taiwan has been doing that in, uh, you know, dealing with those East, Southeast Asian countries. So um, I think in the future we have great potentials to work with India in the study and in the practice of, the, of democracies as well in different areas. I think there, there are a lot of potentials that we can do and, and we won't have the difficulties that we have in Southeast Asian countries. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Roger. Uh, I think this has been a fascinating discussion.
but uh, and i'm not trying to uh, con- uh, uh, summarize the kind of points from here i think this is a terrific for me to kind of do that uh, uh, given the time constraints i'm just going to pass on my uh, pass on the uh, mic to pramisha but uh, thank you sana and roger for uh, joining us this morning and give us sharing your perspective thank you over to you praham pramisha Thank you, Rajiv, ma'am. Um, I want to thank uh, CIER for collaborating with us on this uh, very first uh, track 1.5 that we've organized together, and we are doing the second one in May, uh, which would uh, focus on uh, mostly on economic and technological cooperation. And I hope uh, the this is just the beginning for uh, many more future collaborations. Um, I want to thank Christy and uh, also uh, other uh, people from CIER with whom I had the pleasure of. Uh, co-hosting this conference. Uh, also, my sincere thanks to uh, TECC uh, for helping us uh, do this. Um, and I want to thank my colleagues at ORF and also to all the speakers and participants and the attendees also who joined this. Um, thank you. And it was a very enriching uh, discussion. And as uh, all this uh, panelists very clearly mentioned, we need much more of such uh, think tank level collaborative dialogues to bring forth why this uh, co- uh, bilateral cooperation is much very important given in the Indo-Pacific environment. Thank you everyone for joining in. And with that, uh, let's uh, close this dialogue for the moment. Thank you.